Advice from a Disciple of Marx to a Fan of Heidegger by Mario Santiago Papaschiaro Translated by Laura Patricia Burns and Alicia Reardon and published by La Ratona Cartonera This book is the first edition of the poem in English and is dedicated to the late Rebecca Lopez for all her help and kindness and for keeping the flame of MSP alive. To Roberto Bolaño and Kira Galvan, comrades and poets. For Claudia Kerik and my good fortune at having known her. It's as well at times to be reminded that nothing is lovely not even in poetry, which is not the case. W. H. Auden. The world comes to you in fragments, in splinters. In a melancholy face you glimpse a brush stroke by Dürer. In someone happy, the grimace of an amateur clown. In a tree, the tremble of birds sucking on its nape. In a flaming summer, you catch pieces of the universe licking their faces. The moment in which an indescribable girl tears her Oaxacan camisole exactly next to the half-moon sweat of her armpits. And beyond the peel is the pulp. And like a strange gift of the eye, the eyelash. Maybe not even carbon dating will be able to reconstruct the true fact. These are not the times in which a naturalist painter ruminates on lunchtime excesses between Swedish gymnastic movements and without losing sight of the pinkish blue hues of flowers he hadn't guessed at, not even in his sweetest nightmares. We are actors of infinite acts and not precisely under the blue tongue of cinematographic lights. For instance, today, you see how Antonioni passes by with his customary camera, observed by those who prefer to bury their heads in the grass, to get drunk on smog or whatever, so they don't add to the scandals that already make public roads impassable, by those who've been born to be kissed at length by the sun and its daily ambassadors, by those who speak of fabulous coitus, of females unbelievable in this geological age, of vibrations that would have made you a tenacious propagandist of Zen Buddhism, by those who have once been saved from the kind of accidents that the crime rags call substantial and who, by the way, are not, for now, counted among the flowers of the absurd. So on this trapeze, on the high wire of this thousand ring circus, a grandfather tells of the emotion he felt on seeing Gagarin flitting like a fly in space. And what a pity that the spaceship wasn't called Icarus I, that Russia is so fiercely anti-Trotskyite. And then his voice dissolves seems to stagger amid applause and boos. Reality and desire all around butcher each other, spill over one on top of the other, like they'd never do in a Cernuda poem. Froth flows from the mouth of the one who speaks wonders, and it would seem that he lives inside the clouds and not in the wastelands of this neighbourhood. The humid air of April, the lascivious wind of autumn, the hailstone of July and August, all present here with their fingerprints. Alcohol, urine, what won't have been used as fertiliser for this grass? How many gardeners earning less than the minimum wage will leave in this trap their scant proteins? For now you lie face down in the shadow of the long and hairy legs of the parks where are gathered the one who dreams of revolutions parked too long in the Caribbean. The one who would like to rip out the eyes of the heroes in posters to strip naked the emptiness of the farce. 
The girl with cat-like filmic green eyes. Although close up they may turn out to be blue, who knows? The student, all adrenaline and rebellious pores. The one who doesn't believe in anyone, not even the Kantian beauty of some of Marcuse's female followers. And explodes, screaming that we're putrefied by fury, dehydrated by so many volumes of theory. The worthless occasional whore who shares a torrent of her solitude with strangers, letting the scales of supply and demand be tipped by charm, warmth, sudden vibrations, chance. That other anti-poet and incorruptible vagrant. Those who come here to cry until they carve, as of in wood, the face of a paranoid martyr after ripping up, not precisely out of enthusiasm, the seats of movie theaters. The one who writes his will or epitaph on a wrinkled napkin and then blows kisses into the air. And everyone supposes he's celebrating his birthday or the divine hymeneal song of the night before last. And all these hypotheses are too fragile to explain why he used a pistol and not a paint can. If he seemed capable of seducing to the point of horniness, Giotto's pulse and pupil, the one who always greets people with an I'm hopeless, and you? Those who love rabidly like stray dogs and their green and ripe ears, and they're called florid lovers, and they're an aphrodisiac not only for Marc Chagall's sensitivity, those who know death personally at the hour in which suicide becomes an obsession, some shoveled desires to bite and be bitten to have had it up to here with so many castles in the sand that seem indestructible, to invent for a few seconds a power that the daily cement mixers destroy in you as if you were a scrap of paper. And then you understand the one who'd like to bury beneath tons of plants, buildings, black earth, the slightest heartbeat, the tachycardia of his personal story. You're infected by the nervousness, the anxiety of those who fake their breathing, as if they possessed a certain aftertaste of carnivorous plants and spend hours waiting for friend tenderness. That call girl who rarely comes. Those who come escaping from tear gas and the night sticks of wide avenues. From the great and small stains that just can't be removed by the smell of pine or the caress of a Kleenex. Those who ignore who they are, nor want to know. When the climate's reputation worsens daily, the eternal amnesiacs who suck their thumbs from happiness because the earthly paradise is here and not in Miami. Those who swear oaths declaring that this free, independent island territory will not degenerate into a scrap heap supermarket. At the very moment when a hit song intermingles its rhythm with the peculiar pitter-patter of rain and installs a fatally momentary order so the scene may continue to be dominated by unkempt hair, enormous moist eyes and as if from the same chiaroscuro of the night a girl appears muddying her fists against her thighs repeating one, two, Three times, I am not a sex object. I am not that, robots. I am alive, like a eucalyptus forest. Here, where the norm is to be implacably kind with one another. And this is the least evil. The park trembles. My reflective steps take me through the streets of a port by a green sea that the natives call Mezcalina. A sensation until now unfamiliar, like truly knowing what DNA tastes like after making love. If this isn't art, I'll cut out my vocal cords, my most precious testicle. I'll stop talking nonsense if this isn't art. The branch of a tree bends under the weight of a sparrow, or rather, a sparrow ends up shattering an already broken branch. We're still alive, 
Somehow or other we have to summon the crystal islands that, with an excess of violence, kick the softest parts of your eyes. Reality seems like an issing glass on a miniature scale, but also your eyelids, your perception and its straitjacket. Matter and energy and the will to stick your tongue between its tongue. This is an unusual day. Vibrant, ordinary, anonymous. Couldn't be more earthling, as we tend to say on festive days or during the ever more frequent searching of houses. Fear illuminates your stomach and burns it. There is no ahistorical angst. To live here is to hold your breath and strip naked. Advice from a disciple of Marx to a fan of Heidegger. Poetry. We're still alive. And with your matches you light my cheap cigarette and look at me as if I were a single uncombed strand of hair shivering with cold in the comb of night. We're still alive. One green-eyed, yellow-winged butterfly has pinned itself to the blue lapel of my jacket. My denim body feels like a seducer, a human raider, a pollen magnet that at times acquires the conviction of a diminutive galaxy singing sweet madness between ooze of wonderment. Damn, what a moon! exclaims one wealthy in solitude and wretched in employment who was fired just yesterday because he wasn't thrilled by the short-circuiting of the bureaucratic coffee maker. What a moon! Like a cut fingernail like a cluster of sperm suspended over the bristling back of night. When you listen to a crunch of flattened walnuts crack, the buzzing whine of an ambulance that once again arrives late, the murmur of lizards with leopard skin spots, mischievously climbing the vine in search of nourishment, the last sounds of a picnic where desolation has been up to her old tricks and finally announces the proximity of the wind that stings and gnaws at everything. However, you can still walk here like a happy sparrow, like Chaplin on the day he kissed Mary Pickford for the very first time. Somebody walks around with a transistor radio that looks like a second ear. Galileo discovers the law of the pendulum, observing the sweet swinging of these lovers, violently united and half consumed by fog. The very foolish believing that their bite marked covered love will end up shining in technicolor. And this in the same square meter and at the same moment in which the North Pole and the South Pole, the thesis and the antithesis of the world, get to know one another, like an incandescent meteorite and a UFO in distress and inexplicably greet each other. It was me who engraved on the back of my denim jacket the phrase, The core of my solar system is adventure, that's my name, but I like to be called Kid Protoplasm. You're the one who bites your nails while leafing through the crime section, with fingers confused by the stiffness of the newspaper pages. But is the news those who report it, or those who read it like an indispensable drug? Who, Sherlock Holmes, are the murderers? Given the circumstances, you distrust even your own eyes. Struggles, pursuits, lawsuits of what calibre hide under the most ragged clothes. The fearful climb trees. The most agile prefer to walk, pointing their fingers at the exact moment in which the atmosphere rarefies until you say, Enough! and planes begin to fall as in a sequence from a silent film in which the arms of the dying move like blades without explaining the reason for the fire-slobbered horizon. Though the sky, apparently, looks sober and clear like an irreconcilable enemy of the visual arts, and almost nobody notices the pitiful madman who kisses, licks, bites his watch that has no hands, 
while asking, if the Earth is growing colder, are we leaving its orbit? Certain that in this case, even Jerry Lewis would weep with sincerity. In any given moment, a poem occurs. For instance, the flapping wings of aphonic flies over the bundle that nobody has managed to unravel how much rubbish and how many miracles it contains. For instance, these schoolgirls with their books clasped to their chest, making the head of the gray-haired man with tatty glasses turn, while the slippery wind plays beneath their miniskirts. For instance, Laurel and Hardy sleep their siesta, dreaming of the same mischief in which the custard pie wants to serve as makeup, and two feet are foolish enough to enter where only one will fit. For instance, the one who just yesterday dressed as a woman fled the psychiatric clinic and hasn't yet tired of doing handstands and running around like a crazy kangaroo, asking himself for the meaning of life, for tincture of iodine, to erase his interior bruises. The scratches from insulin and electric shock while singing in ballad style that line by Guido Cavalcanti, Because I don't expect I'll ever return. For instance, this red-haired boy, who soaks his feet in the water of the fountain, feeling like Huckleberry Finn traveling on a wooden raft down the middle of the Mississippi, or the bearded clochard filling his lungs with Turkish tobacco on the banks of the Seine, watching his name written on the water, Lord XYZ while reality navigates like a noisy, agitated steamboat because he knows that life could kill him and revive him at any given moment, in time and space where it doesn't matter, neither Euclid nor his babbling geometry. And in the immediacy, the drag of days that fly by can be seen, represented by whatever guy shouting help, who dials the 911 of his conscience to find out which brand of life or garbage he has to kiss, spit at, or view in horror, whatever guy who shouts or who tries to and can't, while amazement writes, as if with burnt wax, on his retired worker's poker face. That looks like, and in what a way, a time bomb. At times, in the spurt in which a second vomits and turns pale, everything's a tragedy, even happiness, whatever you want. Aeschylus and Harold Lloyd play chess with metal beer bottle tops, but without knowing how the brewer's yeast to make their leisurely creativity grow to the size of an earthquake that might truly wipe the slate clean. When chaos looks robust, even bestial, the face of a bull, the voice of a queer, when you don't have to say that we're economically in the shit, you, me, us, in order not to speak of neurosis and anemia made at home. And what's the use? What's the use of the cyclone, the tombola of things that strip you naked and invade you like amoebas? What's the use if you don't understand for what overpopulation, for what abortions a pregnant woman smiles at you? If you don't capiche, whether it's from desperation or contentment that she pats her belly like the Madonna del Parto by Piero della Francesca. If all you can do is stammer, dilate your pupils when the skillful pickpocket's hand begins to move, this disciple of Shiva, he of the seven arms, god of masturbation, and the assault of the delicate deed, if all you can do is swallow saliva and gesture, when this Ionesco character, perhaps traumatized by the bald soprano, shocks you with a question. Are you sexually, politically, life-enhancingly satisfied? And what's the use if you know in a heartbeat like the palm of your hand, the dew squeezing the gardenia in the early morning mist, like the delicious pubis of the girl who's the relief of your map and the compass that keeps your territory upright. What's the use if there are lives like a car without an engine, desperately sounding their horn without being able to set off? The life of the one who cures his Saturday hangover by wetting his eyes on the edges of fountains. 
the life of the high society lady with her Chantilly cream candy twist hairstyle and her unbearable piping voice when she says, I smoke my own. All these breed of mummies with sacred gestures who feel offended by their increasing contact with plebeians between the soot and the grumpy sun of cities and the life of that wanderer, the one whom the box populi says is always around, whose clarity is broken into pieces, even though his bicycle might not have chased any light in the Sierra Tarahumara, like his namesake, Antonin Arto. The life of the one who spins around in too many circles to kiss a flower, light a cigarette, saying to his lover, let's go to a hotel, let's shatter this white potato face of a moon. The life of the confused bureaucrat who makes a mistake, and more than two times. The man who's going to have the same soap opera face, looking sorry for itself, the next time he passes by here. The life of the ex-queen of the spring pageant in the time of Hiroshima, and who's now a neurotic grandma of mongoloid triplets. The life of the adolescent broke and ready for anything, and with hips that might have strangled Oscar Wilde's pulse. The life of the corny person who says that a park is like the flowery liver of a city while dancing about on the tips of his toes and circling a woman who hasn't even told him her name. The lives of so many, many people who have bathed five, six times in the dark waters of failure and not from choice, so they say. Unlike the one who eats between smiles a meringue, absolutely no way. And this is what you always say, you, me, us, while slowly buttoning up your raincoat, your body and your psychological defenses, and you leave to go for a walk, there will be more than one, in the rain, inside and outside, in the rain, and all because you feel the need, the urge, to loosen up and cry without faking it. With nothing or nobody interrupting you, not even those girls in hot pants glowing their bronze thighs and hugging the golden street lamps. And you're not the only one proclaiming you're the only passenger aboard the schizophrenic submarine while walking like a loony with a once-lit cigarette between your lips and the rain falling grotesquely on you from eye to chin. Of course you're not the only one facing a rusty umbrella of life that doesn't want to spread its wings. You're not the only one for whom the world seems, in a pessimistic moment, a ghetto without bridges nor paths. And sometimes you too limp and become gloomy, scratching your nose in the scab of memory. Existence has the body of a policeman who walks with his state-of-the-art nightstick along the length of your face. And still you ask, what's happening, my big bad wolf? Does repression feel good? While the marijuana plants tremble, planted like carrots in the subsoil of your mind, and your heart is a crowded neighborhood with its gutters and roof tumbling down through pure fear, through pure fear. All in all, oxygen and the rhythmic rotation of the stars survive. September winks an eye at us, and it's better if each one hugs their most cherished waist. A honey-coloured cocker spaniel continues to be lost in sleep while a miserable fly uses its nose as a sofa bed. Litter, peel, papers fly tangled up in the trouser cuffs of the wind that today could rip up a flower then beat it on the ground. But tomorrow, it's goodbye, carbon dioxide, apoplexy, goddamn luck, goodbye. Explain to your occasional friend that even a failed erection forms part of the process. 
this and the fucking vermilion of dusks and the flight of magpies that blacken the air for an instant and the flame of life that disturbs the soft hair on your chest in decisive times and with all the appearance of becoming epic history explain this to your occasional friend clarifying it to yourself let life continue to be your poetry workshop and hopefully you'll electrify the energy of your inner torment alongside the girl with the nimbleness of a sailboat whom you've chosen as the companion of your future walks. Let the love or dementia that inhabits her live in you, lighten your heels, polish the sparkle of your eyes. Hopefully, hopefully. The aforementioned fragments, the splinters, become in hands like those of Houdini a shout so solid and real like a breast or an apple or a desire that turns each body into a transparent prism. The apparently ecstatic and fleeting turns out to be a valuable piece on the chessboard. Behind an ordinary travelling photographer once lived someone called Ernesto Che Guevara and he didn't seem capable of the least sweat-inducing effort, not to mention ethical feats. The apparently ecstatic and fleeting turns out to be a valuable piece on the chessboard. The spirit and passion that accompany you when you cover kilometric avenues recalling the verses the skin of Sappho bathed in moonlight. When you stroke your own face at the moment in which you're a rainbow, scratched by the sun and the four o'clock afternoon drizzle. When you write on naked tree trunks, poetic devices of this century's end. You really got me. You turn me on. You light my fire. How could this be so beautiful? Burning with faith and between waves of pleasure. When you see in this the instinct of the struggle for life that made Rosa Luxemburg euphoric, the living practice of the heretic Wilhelm Reich's favourite theorem, a body learns to read itself alongside another body, and so the university of tenderness is established. When you learn to say no with all the energy of a black belt karate expert, or to say yes, with the certainty that the stars will soon become a color that we don't understand. That the stars will soon become a color that we won't understand until sometimes afterwards. The apparently ecstatic and fleeting threatens with setting on fire and with kisses the hour in which the great political insurrections seem to be buried. That's what bourgeois economists say from their anti-aircraft introspections. But we still see life, deserving of a hand-drawn tattoo, even though, for now, we pose for an invisible photograph that could be the same smoldering climate. Even though, for now, it only seems that beauty becomes emotionally more radical like multicolored t-shirts stating kiss me from the most erogenous zone of their torsos like two snotty-nosed kids it's rumored that they're hippies or those anarchs who promise to meet each other at such and such an hour at such and such a sunset at ray bradbury port in the canals of mars by whatever means possible exactly at that spot under a sky that Van Gogh would be thankful for in six languages. And what whiteness would you add to this whiteness? What spirit? What passion? La realidad de la belleza luciérnaga fugaz 
se posa un segundo en mis cabellos. ¿Qué viento negro podría romperme el paso o intentar siquiera cancelar mi canto?